After 26 years of forecasting the state's financial outlook, he is stepping down. Dr. Tom Stinson joins me now to talk a little bit about why this is the time and what's next. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Stinson. Oh, it's Stinson. good to be here this morning. Let's begin with what were some of the key factors that brought forth your decision to step away? It was just time. You know, the state's economy is in pretty good shape. The U.S. economy is not struggling the way it was before. The state's finances are in good shape. And so it was just time to let Laura Kalambukitis take over without starting out in the hole. You've been making the rounds on television, radio, and now when you, you've been answering a lot of different questions from a lot of different media personalities. So I want to ask you, when you look back, just take a step back and looking at all of the different moments, the people, the personalities that you've been working with and around, what stands out the most? Well, I think the personalities. You know, I've worked for five different governors from three different political parties. And if you think about the personality differences between those people, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, you go from uh, Governor Carlson to uh, Governor Perpich to Governor Ventura to Governor Plenty to Governor Dayton. Not necessarily in that order now, but, uh, but I just, you know, you think about all the personalities. Uh, that was the challenge. How do you get good information to them in a way that they will make use of it? Because everybody has a different learning style. Were there ever any moments where you just wanted to throw your pen on the table and walk out? No, you know, that's, that's the good thing about this job is it's so challenging and so interesting that every day you'd go home and you'd think, boy, I can't wait to come back tomorrow. You know, we'll see what's going to happen tomorrow. Especially in the forecast, you know, you're uncovering rocks, turning over rocks. Uh, oh, here's five million dollars here. Oh, here's ten million dollars less here. You know, how's it going to come out? It, it's just been a great time. Well, and as I'm talking with you, you still have that glint in your eye when you're talking about putting together these forecasts and sharing the information. Is it going to be tough to step down? Has oh, the yeah. reality of it set in? Oh yeah, I'm going to miss it greatly. Uh, you know, it was. It was a great time, but it, it is time for somebody else to do the job, and uh, this is a good time to, to turn it over to Laura. Are you going to make yourself available in a consulting capacity if necessary? Uh, if they want me, but of course, uh, you know, that's their decision. I'm no longer uh, going to be the person in charge of the forecast and uh, we'll go from there. Dr. Simpson, when you had your news conference announcing you were gonna step away, you brought something up that we'd like to dig a little deeper into. You credit Minnesota for having this highly skilled, hardworking workforce, and that's what makes Minnesota unique compared with other states. So in your opinion, what are some of the driving factors in creating this workforce? And let me add on to that, and what do you think the legislature can and should do in the future to ensure this reputation is maintained? Tom Gillespie, the former state demographer, and I have gone around the state for a number of years talking about what makes Minnesota strong, what builds Minnesota's economy, uh, how do we do better. And over the years, what we've come to the conclusion is that the strength of Minnesota's economy is the quality of its workforce. And if you go back and look in the 1960s, and what you see is that per capita personal income, which is a, probably the best measure of the quality of the state's economy, per capita personal income, Minnesota ranked about in the middle, 25th or so. We were 95% of the U.S. average. Today, we rank somewhere around 12th. We're 107% of the U.S. average. So. Our, we've, we've moved up quite a bit in our standings over the last 50 years. And you look at the data and you say, why did that change? What, what's changed? And one of the things that's pretty obvious is the quality, the education of the workforce. In the 1960s, less than half of the Minnesota workforce had a high school diploma. Today, 92%. Now, there was good reason why people didn't have a high school diploma in those years. Some of those people had come of age during the Depression, and it was more important to put bread on the table for their families than to finish high school. Some of them had come of age during World War II, and they'd left uh, high school to, uh, uh, to protect the country. But still, that change from less than 50% to 90%, you know, that's a big change. And what's disturbing, 
now is that we're going in the other direction. Uh, no longer are we graduating 90 plus percent of our high of people out of high school were graduating in the 70s and for blacks, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans we're graduating around 50 percent. And so do you think the legislature should be allocating its resources more towards high school or towards higher education in this capacity, in these terms? I think that that's a false choice. Uh, I think we have to allocate more money to K-12 education. Uh, we have to allocate more money to post-secondary education. And what's important is that we have to be thinking about this group of people that are not graduating and how are we going to get them in a position so that they can make the fullest use of their talents. And so we have to be thinking about enhanced and increased adult basic education as well. Do you think that the work of the la legislature in the last session moved us in that direction? I mean, roughly a billion dollars, less than a billion, in new money, though, towards K-12 and towards higher ed? Or do you think there needs to be even more? I think that we did make a, a step forward, but I think there is still more that needs to be done. And like I said, I'm particularly concerned about adult basic education, that we have this cohort of people that are not graduating, that have not graduated from high school, and we can't just have 15% of this group uh, without uh, a high school diploma. That just doesn't make sense. That creates problems for the economy. It, per it creates problems for society as well. Let's move on to you and your future. You're going to continue teaching at the U of M. Why not just head over to your ranch in Washington and retire? I'm not ready to sit around and watch television and, and do nothing all well, day. Well, farming and ranching is hard work. Uh, some days it is, that's right. Um, some days uh, uh, there's a lot less going on than uh, would keep you uh, amused. And so, uh, so, you know, I'm just not ready to, to step back. I may not ever be completely ready to step back, but this is a big step for me uh, going from uh, being state economist and a professor at the university to just um, uh, teaching and doing research at the university. So Dr. Stinson, any words of advice for your successor, Dr. Colombo You know, she's going to be the seventh state economist, so you've done a lot to pave the way as far as crafting what this position does and, and working with people. What advice do you give her? Well, I think uh, the first uh, set of, or first piece of advice is to remember that you know this is just the best job you can possibly have. And part of the reason why it's such a good job is because the staff is so good. Uh, John Peliquin and Matt Shepner just are really outstanding analysts and they make your life a whole lot easier. And so uh, I'd tell her to uh, be sure and rely on them uh, because they're really great. What about specifically words of advice on working with future governors? Uh, I think the, the advice is to remember that uh, your job is to communicate with the governor uh, so that uh, the governor knows uh, how much money he has to spend without changing the tax rates and that that's always going to be different. Each governor learns differently. Each governor absorbs information differently and so you're going to have to adjust what you present. Uh, to s so that the governor uh, understands. My last question for you, Dr. Stinson. Your job up until now, you've, you've made a point of saying your job is to analyze and give the information without necessarily making recommendations on how to improve things. So here's your chance. If you were to give some advice to future lawmakers, future governors on changing things to improve the state's economy, what advice would you give to them? Well, I think I've already done it uh, today, and I've said that I think we need to be paying attention to adult basic education, that that's important. The second the piece of advice, though, that I'd give is that while we have a reserve, that reserve is not sufficient really to handle the situations that we're going to face in the future. And so looking off into the future, the next forecast or the forecast after that, when we have money to spend, I think it would be a good idea if the legislature and the governor decided that they were going to put aside, say, one dollar in every four or one dollar in every three 
of the future surplus uh, to build up the reserve even larger than it is now. Because while I don't expect we're going to have another great recession, we are going to have another economic downturn. That That's just not uh, 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 going to be a surprise at all. And so we need to be better prepared than we are right now. Well, hopefully they're watching and they'll take this advice. So Dr. Stinson, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. Good luck to you in the future. Well, thanks.